Lizzie Borden's Maplecroft mansion was home to the alleged axe murderer for nearly 35 years after she was acquitted for murdering her parents. It's believed that her spirit hangs on in her beloved home, as well as the home she lived across town where the murders took place. That house is the Lizzie Borden House of Fall River, Massachusetts, offering accommodations and historical tours. In 1892, Lizzie Borden was accused of murdering her stepmother Abby Borden and her father, Andrew Borden, with a hatchet in cold blood. Although there were several suspects, including an unknown thief who burgled the home a few weeks before the murders, Lizzie was the only person arrested and tried for the crime. Imprisoned for ten months, Lizzie stood trial. To the dismay of the entire country, she was acquitted of the crime. To this day, no one but Lizzie knew the exact truth behind the crime. Well, at least not that we know of. When the police investigated the crime scene, there was no hard evidence to be found. No blood spatter on Lizzie or the home's axes. Questioning the household members, they began to put together what they assumed to be the events that had taken place. Lizzie started with her stepmother while she was making the beds. Then turned on her father when he returned home from his job at the bank. Lizzie was arrested a few days later after a lengthy interrogation. The case went to trial, and despite the conflicting and ever-changing testimonies, and the lack of hard evidence, Lizzie was acquitted by a jury of 12 men and set free. Many believe the reason behind the murders involved money, which prompted hatred. Andrew Borden was one of the richest men in the city of Fall River. Despite this, he forced his family to live economically with no amenities such as gas and water. Their kerosene lamps were 20 years behind the times. They had to pump their own water for baths. Their Fall River home sat in an area of town that moderate income earners lived. It brushed up against the ever-working mills. This embarrassed the Borden daughters, who longed for a better life with more affluent means. Lizzie Borden would frequently look up to the wealthier families, including a branch of Bordens, living up on the hill, a neighborhood of Fall River. With their social parties, dances and attendance at concerts, Lizzie craved this rich social life. She never married, and remained a bachelorette at the age of 32. Her mansion Maplecroft would reflect her desire with carvings about friendship on fireplace mantelpieces. There is some question about Lizzie's IQ and ability to understand social cues. She dropped out of high school during her junior year. There is also the question about Liz's father's true relationship with his daughters, whether he abused them, and that's why they fled to the second floor and made it their home for years. Lizzie reportedly stopped eating meals with her father years before the murders. His fortune, however, was set to go to his wife, Abby. Abby and the girls had a loveless relationship that was often tumultuous. Lizzie decided to stay in the Fall River area despite being shunned by the entire town after the 1892 trial. Emma was the sole inheritor of the father's fortune until Lizzie was acquitted. She used some wealth to cover Lizzie's defense, but that was a mere tip of the inheritance iceberg. When Lizzie was set free, she acquired her portion of the inheritance and fulfilled her dream. The year of her release, she purchased the Maplecroft mansion located in the upper crust portion of Fall River known as The Hill. A place she and Emma had longed to live their entire life. And a gorgeous mansion it is. After the acquittal, Lizzie changed her name to Lizbeth. This was to feign away from the reputation she had acquired since the murders. Although everyone knew she was Lizzie Borden, she started a new life under the name Lizbeth. Even her headstone is written, Lizbeth. Lizzie lovingly named her home Maplecroft although it doesn't seem as if any neighboring maples have survived. She and Emma settled into the 1887, seven bedroom, three and a half bathroom luxurious home together. She reportedly had only a few friends but still threw themed parties and entertained in the lavish setting. For the most part, Lizzie lived a secluded life, away from accusing glares of the town folk all around her. The sisters lived life together in the house for 12 years until a dispute took place, and they parted ways. Emma moved to New Hampshire, and the two never spoke again. It's uncertain what their quarrel was over, though some believe it involved a man thought to be the boyfriend of Lizzie. It could have also been over Lizzie's new friend, Nancy Neal. No records are clear involving the argument, but both women lived alone until their deaths, ironically, nine days apart. 
Lizzie was ill in her last year following the removal of her gallbladder. She died of pneumonia on the 1st of June 1927, in Fall River at age 66. Funeral details were not published and few attended. Nine days later, Emmer died from chronic nephritis in a nursing home in Newmarket, New Hampshire, having moved to this location in 1923 both for health reasons and to avoid renewed attention following the publication of another book about the murders. The Borden sisters, neither of whom had ever married, were buried side by side in the family plot in Oak Grove Cemetery. At the time of her death, Borden was worth over $250,000, equivalent to $5,652,000 in 2022. She owned a house, Maplecroft, on the corner of French Street and Belmont Street, several office buildings, shares in several utilities, two cars and a large amount of jewelry. She left $30,000, equivalent to $678,000 in 2022, to the Fall River Animal Rescue League and $500, $11,000 in 2022, in trust for perpetual care of her father's grave. Her closest friend and a cousin each received $6,000, $136,000 today, substantial sums at the time of the estate's distribution in 1927, and numerous friends and family members each received between $1,000, $23,000 in 2022, and $5,000, $113,000 in 2022. Lizzie died at age 66 in her beloved home of pneumonia. Her wake was held in the parlor room of the house. Few attended the service, but that was to be expected. Interestingly, one account says Lizzie had prepared a list of invitees to the funeral. When the invites went out, the attendees arrived, however, the funeral was held on a different day. Sister Emmer fell and broke her hip the day Lizzie died. She died from infectious complications from the fall nine days later. Isn't that a bit of an eerie coincidence? Perhaps it was Liz's way of telling her sister, if I go, you go too, to keep the older sister from ever spilling the beans about the truth of the murders. From the 1940s to the 1970s, Maplecroft was owned by the Silver family. Frank Silver was nine years old when his family took residence in the home. He remembers the home an enjoyable place to live despite the neighborhood kids chanting the Lizzie Borden nursery rhyme to him on the way to school. Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. The rhyme has a less well-known second verse. Andrew Borden now is dead. Lizzie hit him on the head. Up in heaven he will sing. On the gallows she will swing. Silver's grandfather passed away in 1953 in Maplecroft. There's a strong possibility in the same room that Lizzie took her last breath, and he, too, was laid out in the parlor for his viewing. Maybe the unknown ghost that also hangs around the home is him. Maplecroft was placed on the market for nearly a million dollars in 2020. While the owners of the Lizzie Borden house had plans to purchase Maplecroft, COVID and the lack of support from federal and local sources dashed their plans. Placing the property on sale, it was bought by a family with three small children. Dubbed Maplecroft by Borden herself, the 3,935 square foot estate was built around 1887, and the peaks of its grand Victorian architecture sing among the Highlands homes. It includes seven bedrooms and four bathrooms, along with six fireplaces and beautifully stained glass adorning the window frames. The Queen and style home is painted in muted tones of green and beige while the inside features rich shades of walnut and mahogany woodwork. Although floral wallpaper lines each room, the busy patterns are well kept and add a layer of historical charm to the once notorious home. It was also sold with all furnishings inside. Maplecroft was last up for sale in 2017 after the previous owner, Christy Bates, restored the manor to its former grandeur. Donald Woods and Lee Wilber, who own the nearby Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast Museum where the Grizzly murders actually took place in 1892, purchased the home in 2018 with a plan to convert it into a companion museum and B&B to tell the story of the latter part of Borden's life. Woods sank about $200,000 into improvements, according to Jerry Pacheco, operations manager for the Borden Bed and Breakfast and Museum, including installing a sprinkler system that's deftly hidden in the decker. But the city of Fall River asked for additional updates to the property including an elevator, 
COVID hit, and Woods decided he wanted to retire soon. So he and Wilbur opted to put the home on the market for someone else to take whack at turning it into a bed and breakfast or resurrecting it as a private home. Inside, the 14 rooms, including seven bedrooms and three and a half bathrooms, overflow with historic details like walnut wainscoting, corporate ceilings, and ornate mantelpieces that bedeck the six fireplaces. It's incredible, Pacheco says. And it's more impressive when you're inside of it. Honestly, that house has a lot of paranormal activity in it, Pacheco says, speaking from the allegedly haunted Borden B&B, even more than here, I would say. Why would Lizzie be haunting her beloved home? Could she be disappointed by a loveless friendship? In 1905, shortly after an argument over a party that Lizbeth had given for actress Nancy Neal, Emma moved out of the house and never saw her sister again. Kathleen Carbone wrote a wonderful tribute to Nancy Neal on the website, The Hatchet, which Lizzie Borden and mystery enthusiasts should check out. Nancy Neal brought live audiences to their feet and made them cry, feeling their approval or disdain, in person. The boards creaked beneath her six-foot frame, her voice carried into the dime seats, her very fingertips could be seen from the furthest seat in the house. She boldly walked into scenes barefooted, unheard of in her time, and even turned her back to the audience, allowing the considerable musculature of her back to evoke her emotion, a move that frequently baffled critics who, in turn, tore her apart in their confusion. Nance accepted praise and weathered failure with the strange combination of grace and humility that denotes the true star. She was, if anything, a creature of the stage. Born on the 8th of October 1874, in Oakland, California, to George and Ari Findley Lamson, Gertrude Lamson was the second of their two children. Ari Findley was originally from Virginia, and George Lamson was, like Lizzie Borden, a New Englander. Born in Lowell, Massachusetts, an industrial mill town not unlike Fall River, George struck out for San Francisco during the gold rush of 1849. Ari's sister Effie and her family also settled in California. When the gold rush proved a losing gamble, George Lamson turned to a less chancy profession and auctioneered cattle. He was also a devoutly religious man who ran a tight ship at home. Marie finally had a flair for drama and entertained her daughters with art lessons and ghost stories. This odd combination of paternal Yankee Puritanism and maternal Southern Gothic would long hold a fascination for their younger daughter. Gertrude's older sister Lillian left home at 17 to pursue a career on the stage. Unfortunately, not much is known of her stage career, but we know that Lillian achieved some success touring around the country. She was occasionally billed as Lizzie Lamson, an interesting precursor to Nancy's friend, Lizzie Borden. However, one can imagine what her daring departure for the footlights meant for Gertrude. We can be sure that the admonitions flew and the parental reins were tightened as a more conventional life was mapped out for the remaining daughter. But the Lamson were in for another surprise. At 18, their tall and beautiful Gertrude followed in her sister's footsteps and left home a year before graduation. Although Lillian's departure no doubt inspired young Gertrude Lamson, she probably would have sought out the stage anyway. As one who made her own way in life, Gertrude Lamson's pursuit of a life on the pioneer stages out west was an unacceptable path for a young lady. Throughout her twenties, she toured with the McKee Rankin Company to Europe, Hawaii, Australia, India, and South Africa. By the time she was 30, she had seen more of the world than most of her fellow Americans ever would in a lifetime. The idols of her youth were tragedians, Italian Tommaso Salvini, 1829-1916, and Lucille Weston, 1843-1877. Gertrude managed to sneak away from boarding school and into a theater in San Francisco to see Salvini when he toured the United States in 1889. She also saw Eleanor Adews and Sarah Bernhardt, but she preferred the work of Weston. This is ironic considering she would be compared to Bernhardt throughout her career. You can learn more about Bernhardt's contemporary Lily Langry on this channel. Lucille Weston, a brilliant actress who suffered with an addiction to heroin, died before Gertrude Lamson was born. But she was well noted in books, periodicals, and tales from those who'd known her. Weston was a renowned, emotional actress who won fame in many of the parts that Nancy Neal would later succeed in, including Nancy in Oliver Twist, Camille, and Lady Isabel in the new East Lynn. 
Anil was so proficient in the roles that Lucille Weston's mother presented her with Weston's own prompt books. Gertrude Lamson struck out for the stage at an auspicious time. It was an era between the romantic histrionics of Bernhardt and Dews, and the overwhelming slam of vaudeville and bad female roles in Hollywood. It was an era when the American public was attracted to traditional theater as it was becoming more popular and accessible. At the dawn of women's suffrage she portrayed powerful, if doomed, women. And even if most of her plays had to end on a note of warning to the image of a strong female heroine, Camille, Leah the Forsaken, Hedda Gabler, from her reviews one senses that Nancy Neal's portrayals left the audience with the memory of that power rather than the chastised, or deceased, female at final curtain. Her Nancy in Oliver Twist was no shrinking violet. It's no surprise that she failed as Juliet, as one critic noted, she touches the ingenuous, girlish side lightly, and she does the heavier scenes with considerable discretion, although her heavy voice breaks out once in a while and mars the effect. She is fitted for work of greater caliber. After two years of successful touring in the West with Henry and Key Rankin, Nancy Neal went to New York without him. It's unknown exactly why she left, and given the tight leash that Rankin kept on her in later years, it is hard to imagine him sending his young star off on her own to the big city. However, she joined another troupe in New York, took on the leading roles, and eventually toured with them for 12 grueling weeks on the road. While in Minneapolis, Nance suffered a nervous breakdown and returned to New York. Exhausted and despondent, she was admitted to a hospital for an extended recovery. Feeling desperate and alone, uncertain of her future, Nan spent nearly four months in the hospital. But Rankin came to her side and stayed by her until she finally recuperated and returned to him. It was a very long time before she would leave his company again. In that era there was little opportunity for autonomy for an actress. Without money or a powerful family, a single woman was often obliged to find a manager. Rankin discovered and trained Anil, but he also kept her dependent upon him. He lived vicariously through her as his own health declined into alcoholism and obesity, and his long years of non-payment of debts eventually drove her from him. She was once the highest earning actress under his directorship, in San Francisco, 1903, she averaged $10,000 a week in receipts, and was bankrupted under his mismanagement. Rankin more than once referred to money as filthy lucre. He struggled with an altruistic need to separate art from the material world of business and commerce, and this was his downfall. He treated his own and others' hard-earned dollars as disposable, not worthy to bother about. But, by refusing to worry about the earnings of his acting company, it vanished as quickly as it was earned. Nance unfortunately signed power of attorney over to Rankin when she was 20 and, as a result, most of what she earned came and went as well. In 1903, when Rankin had been blackballed by the theater syndicate, she wrote to manager Frank McKee in desperation to get a booking, I don't care what the salary is, provided I can get enough to live on. You can have all the profits. This seemed to have been the extent of the business acumen passed onto her as Rankin's protégé. This code pendants would have indeed her to Lizzie Borden, who was dependent on her father's penny pinching her entire life. But who was she, this enigmatic, great beast of the stage, as she once described herself after a particularly rough critical drubbing? Surely there was more to Gertrude Lamson's persona than being known as Rankin's acting student or kept mistress or presumed lover of Lizzie Borden. The Literary World magazine wrote that Nancy Neal was easily the finest English-speaking actress. Physically, she is splendid, a superb figure, a handsome face, a wonderful voice, and every movement is grace itself. In San Francisco, a critic described her voice as Sometimes a whisper, sometimes a guttural, harsh growl, and again it is vocal velvet, while in climaxes it is like a great organ. Yet every variation of tone compels you to listen and there is no escape. She uses it in so many ways that one fancies that she has exhausted every variety, and then a new tone will come that will show there is evidently no end to its variations. Robert Sullivan, an assistant stage manager, described her portrayal of Lady Macbeth in the sleepwalking scene. He recounted her technique of stage whispering the dialogue like a babbling child's rhyme, which grew into a ghastly wail. With her eyes wide, but clearly sightless and dreaming, she backed into a wall and awakened in hysterics. We were afraid of her when we had to run on after that curtain. 
She was still screaming, rent by great, big, terror-stricken sobs. Then, when the people were through with making her bow, she stood quite worn and spent in the middle of the stage pitiably asking for her shoes. The poor woman had actually played that scene barefoot and was cold, tired, and worn out. Thirty-six curtain calls would often greet her. She traveled extensively during her career, and summered in the south of France with a group of bachelor girls, like herself, and shared a house there with fellow actress Peg Bloodgood, Beasley 488. She also loved to paint landscapes when not working on stage and, in 1910, several of her oil paintings were exhibited at the Actors Fund of America's Fair at the New York City Army. In her early 30s, after a decade of touring a world seen through the plasticine bubble of show business, Gertrude Lamson longed to discover herself and explore her roots, particularly, the Yankee Massachusetts heritage of her father. Perhaps she had begun to suspect that it was not their differences, but their similarities, which were the real clues to who she really was. George Lamson had left the settled industrial city of Lowell, Massachusetts, for an unknown pioneer west, hoping to strike it rich. Gertrude Lamson had left her secure and loving family for an unknown world on the stage and had struck it rich as Nance O'Neill. But not through luck, she had striven, worked, and denied herself many of life's comforts and joys for the stage. She had stuck it out with the determination and steadfastness of a, well, a stubborn Yankee. To find herself through her father, she went back east in 1904. She wanted to study his people, their language, and their manners. She had been warmly welcomed in Boston, in fact one periodical claimed that the city was Nance O'Neill mad. This quest would lead her to purchase a one for six acre estate in Tingsboro, Massachusetts, on the Merrimack River, near Lowell, her father's birthplace. Brinley Farm became her haven in the off-season for three summers. Unfortunately, the manners of her neighbors in Tingsboro left much to be desired. If Boston loved her talents, the suburbs did not. Residents insulted her as she passed them on the sidewalk and as she walked from the train station, and she eventually packed up and left. However, she loved Brinley while she summered there, and her Massachusetts pilgrimage resulted in the passing acquaintance of a certain devoted fan, producing that reputed notorious friendship with Lizzie Borden that she would never outlive. When she married fellow actor Alfred Hickman in 1917, Nance O'Neill was 42. They continued to work together in many Broadway productions, with Hickman now performing as her manager. The marriage lasted until 1931 when Hickman unfortunately died. When the tidal wave of film nearly drowned theater, they both found work in film, with Hickman taking on the duties of teaching acting students, as well. Nance recreated some of her more famous stage roles in silent films, but by the time of the talkies in 1929, Hollywood didn't know what to do with Nance and Eel. She was older, and years of stage acting and smoking had deepened her already stentorian voice. She was too strong, too frightening, and too damn tall. However, she was professional, showed up on time knowing her lines, and took direction without fuss, so the film industry did what it could with her. For the most part she was cast as unmarried female villains, or into comedic roles that accentuated her height and her remarkable voice. It was less than worthy of her talent, but it paid the rent. Nancy Neal knew where she belonged and kept an apartment in New York, where she continued to act. Her sheer emotional outpouring exhausted her. A great chunk of her life was spent just preparing for the onstage moments. It took up much of her energy, leaving little free time. In a Boston Globe interview later in her life she admits, the public little realizes the long hours of rehearsing, of studying, of trying on clothes, buying shoes, having pictures made. All that glitters isn't gold, and even the brightest career must have hours of despondency. At one point, she asked that her friends call her Diane, indicating an actor's variable sense of self. This mirrored Lizzie Borden's name change to Lizbeth. O'Neill had a dramatic belief in fate, and a mystical side that pulled her through some of the more earthly disappointments. My art is my world. I love it, she told Grant Wallace in an interview. An actress must know the despair of her heroines. She could have experienced those passions in other lives, thousands of years ago. Acting lifts the actor out of the sordid, narrow life and thrusts him into a bigger world where he stands in mute handclasp with the larger, cosmic emotions of the gods. 
In later life she was remembered by a visitor. She had dyed red hair which she obviously did herself because it was different shades and different patches of hair. There was one bit over her left ear which was almost purple. She must have gotten the wrong mix or something. She had dead white skin. And she must have put on that mascara with a teaspoon, you know. Just dug it up and went flip, flip, and dug little holes to look out of. And she had rouge in the old-fashioned way. I mean right on the cheekbones, a well-defined patch of rose red. She was dressed in black, something silk or satin that was an old dress, cut on the bias. There was some black lace somewhere. And she had two wristwatches. She had a fancy little wristwatch that was cold, and she had, it wasn't a Mickey Mouse watch, but had something on it like that, with a plastic band. Right together these two watches. And she was wearing tons of pearls. To my eye, it looked as though half of them were real and half were fake. Then she had this flashy diamond ring. And she was carrying, God bless the lady, I had not seen one since I left Mobile, Alabama, she was carrying a reticule. In the fabric that matched her dress. She was swinging her reticule. And she had a little brass-headed fruitwood cane, very slender, very elegant. She must have been 95. Joseph Cameron Cross introduced her, oh, Eugene, you know Nancy Neal. She was smoking cigarettes two cigarettes at a time. And someday I must do a drawing or painting of what I saw as I glanced down and saw the very beautiful gold Cartier watch and the Felix the Cat watch. The diamond ring, one cigarette lit, two pieces of toast, another cigarette in a little ashtray smoking there, and a fork. I thought, they don't make them like they used to. She was a prima donna in the best sense. Prima donna usually means self-centered or self-consciously defined center type, male or female. And usually unaware of other people's rights or reactions or necessities. But a real prima donna has the generosity of spirit which includes putting the shy at ease. Noticing the invisible. Putting down the bore gently. Tanila Bankhead was a perfect example. It has to do with cat and monkey sense of humor. And this, Miss Anil had. I found that the greater the talent, usually the gentler, kinder, and especially the more humorous they are. He related that Anil ordered, the usual, from the waiter, which turned out to be a washbin of Welsh rabbit, a mountain of toast, and a gallon of beer. She was very hard to forget. Nance Anil died on the 7th of February 1965 at the age of 90. She had been a resident at the actor's home in Inglewood, New Jersey. Her obituary featured a less than complimentary photograph of her, with the succinct, UN sugar-coated announcement, Nancy Neal, 90, tragedian of stage in early 1900s, dead. Like Lizzie Borden, she loved dogs. There is a full-length portrait of Nancy Neal as Lady Macbeth in the Players Club dining room in New York. Painted by her friend, artist Paul Swan, it is magnificent, reminiscent of John Singer Sargent's Ellen Terry as Lady Macbeth. But Sargent painted Lady Macbeth sedate in her madness, eyes glazed over, standing full length, and grandly crowning herself. Through Swan's eyes, Nancy Neal's Lady Macbeth is alert, crouching, gathering her skirts about her, eyes shifting. She is ready. She is the lookout as Macbeth murders Duncan off scene. The impression Swan drew from Nancy's portrayal was one of plotting and carrying out the deed. A beautiful villain of action who is not afraid to conspire and to act. In a snippet of conversation in which Nance Neal discussed Lizzie Borden, Walter described this passage as Nance's reply, after he got up the nerve to ask her about Lizzie. This is what Nance said. I won't say I was nervous being in a house with Lizzie Borden. After all, there were a lot of us together. You can be sure we looked out for each other and made a point never to be alone with her. And to notice how sharp her dinner knife was. But there was one thing I do remember as striking me. She would often make me repeat for her at tea time Medi's famous speech. Often the night of thunder I have a message from the gods on high. They ask me why I have not slept. Why in the morning I will touch no food. Then I tell them of my sleepless night and why I did not sleep. Because, I tell them, this house smells of blood.